Hello, everyone. I'm your host, Joel Bryce, and welcome back to another episode of Delta Waterfowl's The Voice of the Duck Hunter podcast. You're about to listen to podcast episode number 21. Prior podcast topics have run the gamut covering subjects like down and dirty duck biology, wild game cooking, harvest regulations, and fall hunting season forecasts. We're about to cover one glaring topic that we've missed, and that's duck dogs. If you currently have a duck dog or have hunted over someone else's dog, you understand how important and special of a role they play in waterfowl hunting. To help me discuss the magic of duck dogs, I'm joined by two great guests, Chris Aiken and Josh Miller. Both gentlemen are kennel owners, professional dog trainers, and avid duck hunters. Welcome, guys. How are you? All right. I brought you in. So for those that are watching this podcast, they can see you now. So everything you do is, is uh, now documented. So be careful. <laughs> Good to know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Welcome. So, so Josh, you're in Wisconsin. Chris, you're in Arkansas. Do I have that correct? Correct. Yes, sir. Awesome. And just by hearing you talk, Chris, I, I think people can tell which one's from Arkansas and which one's from Wisconsin. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Don't sound like a Yankee, that's for sure. That's right. You're outnumbered. I'm a I'm a Wisconsin transplant. Yeah, that's right. That's yeah. right. So we've got you two to one. And yeah. uh I'm in North that's the way Dakota. We like it. Yeah, I'm in North Dakota now, but uh I, I still have that Midwestern mentality. So appreciate it. So hey guys, appreciate you taking the time. You know, you both have long careers, a lot of a lot of tread left on the tires. Uh, and but appreciate you taking the time here to talk about duck dogs, right? I mean, as duck hunters, we love our dogs. Um, you know, they're family members 12 months of the year. And and uh, you know, I guess in the duck marsh and in the fields, they shine for a couple, three months out of the year. But it's a it's a great subject to talk about. Chris, I, I want our listeners to get to know our guests, you know, and, and not just not just take, but I want them to give too. So let's let's get people to learn about you. Chris, let's tell us about your, your upbringing. Where are you from? And maybe some of your early introductions to hunting and dogs. Well, I live in Northeast Arkansas, which uh, is just duck Mecca. I mean, I, Jonesboro is surrounded by Black River, White River, Langville River, St. Francis, Cash. I mean, Mississippi's right down the road. I mean, we've got all the great duck rivers right here. Uh, you know, white, black. I mean, we are dead set in the center. And so if you're from Jonesboro and you don't waterfowl hunt, you're missing out. So I grew up here, went to school here, uh, you know, lived here uh, basically my whole life and uh, just duck hunted. You know, it's just what you do here when you live here. And uh, so I started hunting uh, in a big way in the 80s uh, here and, you know, back when it was really, really good. And uh, I've done every style of hunting there is. I've hunted on the St. Francis River and river style blinds. I've hunted all the green timbers. Uh, I've been real fortunate through clients and friends and to, to hunt in all the best places there is around. And and we by far have some, some phenomenal uh, hunting places within a, a really a 10, 15 mile circle of my house and my kennel. Uh, so very fortunate for where I grew up to what I do today. Uh, it, it's, a, it's just an unbelievable setting for it for sure. Yeah. So, oh, that's, that's awesome. So did you, was this, was hunting hand me down for you or is that something? No, that not, not at all. Uh, my, you know, my family did deer hunt a little bit and that kind of thing, but I, I just went with some, some friends and, and, you know, from school and, and just fell in love with it. The first group of mallards we lit in the timber and uh, we killed four or five out of one group. And I mean, if, you, if that doesn't do it for you, you're not, it's not going to. And from that point forward, it's been a disease uh, for me. I've literally missed, you know, like, minimal of, I tell everybody one day since I was a junior in high school but be real honest I'll probably miss four or five days since I was a junior in high school and uh and we we, we work at it year round uh you know I got some stuff I got to do at the duck club this afternoon uh we we everything we do evolves around duck hunting on a daily basis from what we do for a living with a kennel uh, our friends, uh, and to, of course, all winter long, that's all we do. You know, we, we that's, that's all we do is hunt every day. And uh, we've got a, a wonderful place to hunt. And it's a, a very easy place to hunt. We entertain a lot of people and take a lot of people and just really enjoy the season right here, right in our backyard. Wow. So, and, and then I guess in terms of your current profession, let's call it your profession, you, you own a kennel. It's called Webfoot Kennel. Is that right? 
web web footed kennels. That's right. And we okay. we started that thirty years ago, and uh, it's kind of a crazy story, you know, as that we've all have. But I, I I sent a dog off to a trainer, and he didn't do a very good job. And I went to another trainer and talked to him, and he suggested that I at the time, but you know, train it myself. And he had just written a book, and he gave me a book, and and I got a puppy from him, and started all over, and and I did real well with that dog, and and from that point. Uh, you know, I, I just had that dog with me and there wasn't a lot of dogs around at that time. And when they were, they were just straight up what we call meat dogs. I mean, you shoot, they go, they pick a duck up, bring it back. That was about all the frills and thrills you had back then. And, uh, you know, that was just, and there wasn't many of them. I mean, there just, there wasn't hardly any. When you keep in mind, most people would hunt in this area, hunting rice and bean fields and flooded, you know, which are not deep or, you know, anywhere from four to 10 inches deep and, uh, a lot of passing shots and, and a lot of birds, you know, going all over the place. Uh, we hunt out of pit blinds in those rice fields. And so you'll have four or five, six guys in a pit. A group of mallards comes in there, boom, boom, boom. First two or three fall on decoys. There's one falls out at 100 and one falls out at 200. A dog's a very handy tool. And especially in that mud and, and especially as we got a little bit older in, in years and didn't want to have to walk in that mud with waders on and all that stuff. And so dogs became a big part of the deal. And as, as I trained and had Dixie, uh, which was my first real great, you know, really, really good dog, uh, you know, people just said, hey, I want, I want you to train me a Dixie. And I trained a guy one. And he had two friends. I trained them two. They had two friends. And I trained them. And they had four friends. And, <laughs> it just kept going and going to what it is today, which is a, which is a disaster. Uh, it, it sounds like, but it's really, it's just what we do every day. And, and we have a hundred dogs in training at a time. Uh, you know, we, we, we've all this thing in the hunt test, uh, all over the country every weekend and I'm uh, titling dogs all the time. And, uh, you know, but it, you know, all these dogs are family pets, companions and duck dogs for other people. Uh, you know, we've got to meet some of the greatest people in the world and become family friends of ours throughout the kennel. And, you know, been doing it for 30 years. So I'm training their second and their third, and their children's dogs and, and, and you know, and, and all their friends' dogs. So it's it's all a big family affair. It's amazing how many of the same clients we had today we had 25, 30 years ago. Just it's a, it blows my mind how many we've got. I tell you what, I, I did some research on you and you're, you're a heck of an accomplished uh, dog professional. How can people learn more about you, Chris, what, where would you send them? Well, you know, we, we do everything. We're real simple kennel here. I'm not a, a, a super big social media guy. We do everything through our Facebook page at web food kennels. And we, we mainly use that to announce to people that we've got some litters for sale. Uh, I've got a dog for sale and a little bit about what we're doing every now and then. Uh, and, you know, we don't really toot on our own horn as probably as much as we should, but we, we run a lot of hunt tests and, and, uh, you know, and do a lot of that. Sometimes we'll post some stuff about that. Um, and, uh, but, but we mainly do everything through Facebook is, is what we do. Then, you know, when, man, I'm still old fashioned. I just love people just dial me up and call me up and, and visit about it and talk about it. And, uh, and we go from there. So, uh, I'm not as big as some of these other, these other, like these Josh Miller millennials of the world. <laughs> I'm going to get him. And I'll uh, do it on the emails. Yeah. Like that. Uh, We're going to start taking world. folks at each other. Let's do it. Uh, yeah, that's yeah, pretty good. Uh, yeah. So, no, but you know, this younger generation does a little bit different. That's old school guys do. And, and uh, you know, Josh is a great combination of both. He he gets it on both sides of the fence, but I don't. I really don't. I'm, I'm old school. And, and uh, you know, I do the I do the old fashioned way. Give me a call and we'll talk it out and finish it out and, and fix it for you and get it done. You know, everything we we do it up from start to finish. We we sell puppies, we sell the trained dog, we'll train the dog for you, we'll run the dog for you, uh, we'll do whatever. You know, if it's, if it has to do a labrador retriever, we're in. So uh, that's just. Uh, but anyway, so just give us a call. And we'll help you any way we can. Sounds great. Web footed kennels. Yeah. Gosh, let's move to you. Give us your early life introduction to hunting and dogs? Uh, well, so my, my upbringing was actually uh, a little similar to Chris, you know, Chris has been a really good friend and a mentor of mine for a long time. It's funny. I, I never knew that, that, you know, his, uh, his family wasn't a duck hunting family. I just assumed that it was, um, mine was similar. Mine, my dad and my grandpa and my uncle and my brothers, you know, they're, they're all deer hunters. And that's kind of the, you know, the thing up here in Wisconsin, specifically during gun season, it is deer hunting. You know, it's like the, it's really, it's, it's, it's like duck hunting in Arkansas, right? It's like what everybody looks forward to. And, uh, and 
I, I love bow hunting. I, I archery hunt a lot. Um, but there was something about ducks that just tripped my trigger. And I loved watching them. I loved listening to them. But not being in a, in a waterfall hunting family, it, uh, it wasn't something that I really had the opportunity to do a whole lot of. And so my grandfather had a cabin up in northern Wisconsin where he had you know, an 80 acre you know, parcel, but it was on a lake. And what ended up happening was that, you know, my entire family would get up and go, you know, in the back, uh, the back 80 and go deer hunt. And when they'd get up in the morning and do that, I would take my little skiff out and paddle it on the lake and I would go duck hunt. And, uh, you know, so I was kind of the black sheep in my family that way. And, you know, you do that for a year or two and you start going, well, I kind of want someone to spend this time with. And so I ended up getting a, uh, I ended up getting a, a pup. Uh, I did it the way that I preach not to do it now. You know, I just found a litter in the newspaper and, you know, went to go you know, pick, pick this puppy up and, um, it is nothing short of a miracle that that dog turned out to be what he was. Um, yeah, I, I have a very obsessive personality where I don't like to do things halfway. I like to go all in. And so I, you know, read every book and watched every DVD and spent all my time that I could, you know, with this, uh, this dog. And at the time I was in high school. So I was, uh, I was a you know, three sport athlete in high school. And so I didn't have a ton of time, but what it was for me, it was a disconnect. You know, it was like during the summer when I've got, yeah, I got you know basketball camp in the morning, and I've got a baseball game that night, and you got you know all the stuff going on. It's like it was my time just to have some me time. And I just really enjoyed that. Um, and so, as fate would have it, as I, I feel like oftentimes these things you know work out that way. Uh, I was in a sportsman's warehouse in Woodbury, Minnesota, and I was in the dog aisle just looking at stuff. And there's a guy in the aisle and he comes over. He's like, you know, uh, you know, do you have a dog? You know, we start kind of talking. Well. Long story short, he was the secretary for um, for the retriever club that was in my area. He was like, man, you really should come out, you know, just kind of see what it's all about. So he convinced me to. And so, um, yeah, I take my dog up there and I have no idea what to expect. I'm nervous as I'll get out. Well, I had no idea the level that I had that dog trained to because I, I don't have friends or, you know, my dad or anyone else that has trained dogs. And so uh, I go up there and, and to my surprise, I Real progress through this you know, really well with this dog. So they actually had a, a what they called a fun trial coming up there in a couple of weeks. They convinced me to enter it, and uh, and I won that with that dog, which was the most expensive. Uh, that ribbon was the most expensive thing I've ever gotten in my life because that led me down the path of uh, doing this professionally. And um, and kind of to echo what Chris has said, you know, some of my absolute best friends that I have um, lifelong family like friends have come through the dog you know, side of things. And so it's really interesting how these dogs, you know, connect you, know, you with, um, you know, people that end up being so close to, you know, to you in your life. And so, um, fortunately, you know, for me, you know, Chris is one of those, those people in my life. And so, um, I'm very grateful for that first dog. I'm grateful for every dog that I've gotten, you know, after that. And, um, I think you will, with each dog, it just kind of elevates you to take it, you know, one step further. And, you know, we're always trying to, you know, better what we did, you know, the day before. So that's pretty exciting. It, it's, you know, I, I, I meet people at times that, that make me excited about the future and, you know, Josh, and you're like, yeah, I, if I had talked to you a year before that, where you weren't even duck hunting, didn't have a dog or two years before that, whatever it was. And now you've turned it into a career and, and Chris, man, it sounds like, you know, you've just lived waterfowling and, and dogs and, so you probably can't find that separation between your personal life and your professional life, can you, Chris? It's it's one and the same, hundred percent. And the, the the duck hunting deal is is uh, for us is year round, and so the dog deal just gets me to that. Okay, so the dogs are what has enabled me to do all that, and and it's it's just it's a wonderful wonderful deal for, for me to be into both of them. But the waterfowl is definitely the disease that causes the dogs. Because there is, you know, I mean, we all know how much fun it is to shoot a duck out of the air, but there's nothing more fun than watching a dog go out there and get it that you just shot, especially if it's a, you know, some type of a retrieve that's not your standard everyday deal on a decoy. And anybody that doesn't like that isn't going to enjoy on the dog. But it's it's a very contagious disease, believe me. I've seen it over and over and over. A lot, a lot of fun, and uh, and, yeah. and you can take a guy like Josh who didn't have anything to do with it, and just head over heels. And now his whole life is, it revolves around his family, his wife, his children are going to grow up in it. I mean, it is a, it's a, a very infectious disease. I'll promise you that we all love. 
I can guarantee. It is. It is. You know, it's kind of that, I think, as as dog owners and, and duck hunters, I think we always have that. I hear it all the time. Yeah, if I had to choose between my gun and my dog, I'd take the dog. And and that's honestly, someone else can shoot the birds. Yeah, absolutely. But, it, but without a dog, it's just, it's not duck hunting to me. I actually lived about three years without a duck dog. I've, we've had dogs, you know, my whole life. But I had about a three-year span there where I had two young kids. I traveled. I had horses. And I'm like, wow, if I travel and bring a pup into this situation, you know, with my wife, it's just, it was just wasn't a good family situation. So it was about three years without a duck dog. I think I went duck hunting literally twice. And I didn't enjoy it. That's why I didn't keep going. Because it was just the most important part was was missing. And that was the dog. And so I don't think I'll, I'll never go without a duck dog. And, uh, you know, obviously, let, like, let, let me interrupt you on something like that. Why would anybody want to go through life without a duck dog? I, look, I duck hunt every day, every day of my life. And, and I'm going to until the day I die. I promise you. But my dog's with me 24 hours a day, seven days a week, my personal dog. And my list, I'm, you know, I'm a little bit older than you guys. My list is long of my personal dogs that I've had. But they're with me 24 hours a day. They're extension of me. And because of what I get to do and, and, and what I am, I, I can't imagine. I mean, when I get out of my truck, I got to open the back door and let my dog. Go. When I go to my truck, I got to open my back door and let him in there. When I go to work, my dogs go with me. When I leave the house, I mean, it's just who I am. I can't imagine not having that in my life. They would be, I, I would be like me not having my own. And, and for you to be without a dog for three years, um, you know, I can't even imagine that. I mean, because the, the, we, we can talk about duck dogs all we want. But the dogs are such a, such a more bigger picture to me than just being a duck dog and just going to get my duck or my goose. Uh, it's just, it's just such, such a huge deal that you're missing out on. If you just have it, just go get your ducks. Oh no. They, I offer hear so yeah. much, they offer so much more. I didn't enjoy that period of, of that. I, I can see that. It was definitely <laughs> something missing. You know, when you have that favorite, you know, you have that long time dog sleeps in a certain spot, has certain things that it carries around. And when they pass, Every little thing out of the corner of your eye is that dog, right? And so I had that for three years. So I'm glad it's over. And I'm a large dog that I have right now. Josh, let's let's kind of let's I think what people will find looking back on this podcast, we're gonna wander. And this is an intentional wandering. I call podcast organized BS sessions, to be honest with you. You know, we want to cover something. And so I think the goal of this is hey, for those that love duck dogs, they're just hopefully they just love talking, listening to our conversation. But if someone's considering getting into it, we'll cover a few things. That hopefully fire them up, you know, provide some information, some resources. So, Josh, duck dogs. I already talked to you guys. You're you're lab men, so so am I. But duck dogs aren't just labs, you know. Josh, what are some, you know, run a list, and Chris will see how good he does, and maybe you can fill it in if he misses a few. Well, so it's interesting. So right now, you know, we not only have Labradors in, we have. Chesapeake Retriever in, we've got a Boykin in, we've got a Water Spaniel in, we've got a Golden Retriever in. Um, I'm sure I'm missing somebody, but I mean, that's just what we have in the kennel right now for training. And, and it really goes to show you that, that all the, the, there are a lot of breeds out there that can go do this, right? And I, th- I think the big thing is fitting the breed to your personality. You know, some people that you know, are maybe a little different speed or have a little different taste might go with a different breed. Um, you know, but Labradors are what we mainly see. Like you said, I'm a lab guy, you know, you guys are lab guys. And I think the reason for that is that they just, they hit and check all the boxes, right? As far as they're that dog that's had, got that high drive and high ceiling in the field, but then you can come in and have them be a part of your family 365. They fit that bill so well. I mean, there's really nothing that they can't do. And, and what's fun to me about that is to echo what you guys were talking about. I think you guys were kind of hitting it maybe without saying it is that the reality is that these dogs are, are part of our family, right? They are, they're a family member first and hunting dog second. I can say that about my own dogs, which I hunted. I hunted 98 days last year and my dogs are still a member of my family first and my hunting dog second. And just the reality of it, you know, they're tremendous athletes. They're great hunting dogs, but they're part of my every single day life. And so, you know, I think when, when you go down this road, you think about, I'm actually literally getting text messages right now, which is, I'm kind of in a, an awkward part of my career where you know, have had the kennel now for, I think, 11 going on 12 years, you know, I'm literally getting messages right now about a dog that passed away last night. That was a dog that I trained, a dog that I uh, 
made to be a very special dog and ended up being an extremely special dog to this individual. And I mean, you can, you, you just feel heartbroken. You're reading, you're reading what he's you know, writing in these messages and these reflections that he has about this dog. You know, it's, it's incredible the impact that they have on our life. And so, um, you know, just kind of going back to your guys' point of, of there's so much more than duck dogs, you know, and I think, um, you know, the journey that they bring us down it's, it's got to be worth it, right? Otherwise, we wouldn't volunteer to go through the heartbreak all over again. Yeah, that that is the thing. We sign up for it time and time again, and they break your heart, but there's, you know, nothing will take their place. But but the next dog will, will make it not hurt so bad. Chris, you've probably seen a lot of an awful lot of dogs go as well, I guess, as no. we all have. Well, you know, it, it just goes to show you that all the rewards way outweigh the torture that we go through when we lose that special dog. And they have to really keep doing it to ourselves over and over and over. You know, and I don't know too many people with this infectious disease that don't have more than one dog at home. I mean, you know, we, we've got six that live in our house and uh, you know, it's just, that's a lot. And we've got a lot of old dogs. We've got, we've got, we we almost like a retirement home for, for grand champions in my house. And uh, we love it. You know, we, we, all those dogs are, they go everywhere we go and all that. But, you know, back to hit on, on the different breeds, you know, like Josh was talking about, we have Chessies. We've got Goldens. I'm a big Golden fan, real big Golden fan. I've had some really good ones. We've got all three colors in labs. And we even got a poodle here right now, standard poodle. And, uh, you know, the, the, the labs definitely, uh, like Josh nailed it, they, they kind of check all the boxes. For some reason, to me, what's odd is that in today's world, everybody wants to be a little different. You know, some people have red in their hair. Some people have bone through their nose. Some people have tattoos on them. Everybody's just got to be a little different. I'm scared that that's kind of drifting over into the dog world because, you know, a lot of these other breeds, they may, yeah, they may go get a tennis ball and they may go get a bird in the water. But at, at the end of the day, if you're truly a duck hunter and you truly kill birds, and you truly hunt like Josh and I do with large parties of people. I mean, Josh and I love to entertain people. We love to be entertained with people. I mean, we love to have a good time. and have a, The last thing I want to do is go out there with something and go out there and have six, eight people and us really killing birds and our dog not be able to keep up with the pace, not be able to get those birds. Whatever. We're here to entertain. Everybody have a good time. Not like, Oh man, I hate that for his little dog, and I hate he's not doing a good job. I hate, you know, we don't want that. We want everybody. We're here to make people's dreams come true, with their dogs, with the hunt, with everything. And uh, so I think that labs en- enable us as trainers and as as people that guide people through everything. It makes it easy for us for us to be successful in our career by leading people to labs. Now, labs is a big work. Okay, that's a huge word for us because there's a lot of different dogs in the lab world. Okay, and when I say that, you know, we we talk about the British lab, we talk about the American lab, but there's so many differences even in those. You know, you can get American lab, man, they can be as lazy as all get out. They can be absolute wild heathers. Same thing in the British dogs. And so, you know, you, you got to be careful what you get. You got health wise, good Lord, good Lord, that's a whole nother can of worms. You got to be careful what you get. There's so much information out there today. There's so many great breeders out there. There's so much information on the internet now that you can't miss if you just try. I mean, they will, they, it will literally put you on a bullseye and let you touch a trigger. And especially with people like us out here guiding you in a way, because we, because we get it. We get the, the personal pet companion duck dog slash hunt test dog if that's what you want to do we get that and we can help people with that every day but don't get too crazy on trying to be different when it comes to your dog go put pink in your hair or something or go put an earring in or do something don't don't mess with the lab thing i'm just telling you uh, like i said i can't take I'm, I'm a big golden fan i i'm, I'm a huge golden fan i have big luck a lot of luck with them uh i'm even got one i've got ordered right now that i'm gonna be getting a puppy before long and it's gonna be a golden but it's a line i've had this will be a fifth generation for me on these goldens and all of them been grand champions all of them health health clearances and, and a very well bred golden is hard to be so anyway the only one i the only one that jumped out at me that you guys missed were springers that was uh i grew up with the first few years of of my hunting life were with springers then we quickly jump to labs and never look back. Uh, so, hey, this is a, I think we're all tired of the word COVID. I am, um, but it's, it's everywhere in life. Someone told me that there's a sporting dog shortage as a result of COVID. 
Do any is there any truth to that? Unbelievable. Really? Unbelievable. Josh, you want to go yeah. first on that? Yeah, I, I can. I mean, what what we saw as a part of it. Well, so there there are two pieces, right? So we all know about the puppy boom, right? Like like people were buying puppies like crazy. Uh, breeders were probably breeding puppies, you know, like crazy, trying to keep up. And I am the end of the day, grand scheme of things, it's not a good thing for anybody, right? Because if, if you're just breeding to produce puppies, you're not breeding, you know, probably the quality that you're looking for if you're just trying to produce puppies. If you're buying on a whim, if you're buying, you need one tomorrow, you're probably not doing your homework or getting the right dog, right? And so we're starting, not only starting, we've been seeing that for probably the last six months or so, the repercussions of this of like, oh my gosh, now I've got this, you know, 15 year commitment and maybe it's not the dog I want. Maybe it's not the breed I want. Maybe I have health issues, maybe I have all the stuff. And so there's a lot of these repercussions that are coming from it. Um, you know, but you know, for like for us personally, at, yeah, in our kennel, we didn't see necessarily the, the, the pushback on that because we have about a year and a half waiting list to get a puppy. So we couldn't provide you a puppy right away, but we're seeing it on the training side of people come in saying like, even just obedience, like I need obedience. This dog is out of control. I'm going back to work now. I'm not spending you know all the time yeah, at home with the dog. And the, you know, the, the commitment that was made is there, right? So now they're having to try to figure out how do I live with this and how do I go on? It's a, it's a rough thing. It's a rough thing to see, um, you know, especially because there's a lot of people out there that were still trying to do it right, you know? And so they're still doing their homework and they're going through the right paces. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, we're definitely seeing it. Like it's, it's kind of coming back and we're starting to see more and more of it all the time. What are your thoughts on that, Chris? Well, you know, what I saw was, was yeah, I think there was no better time with people working from home, uh, not having to go to the office, not having to go to ball practice, not having to go to gymnastics, not having to go to all the stuff that we all have consumed our lives with. Uh, there was no better time to raise a puppy at home because you could potty train it, you could be there, spend all that time with it and do all that. So there was a little bit of pluses to that at that time. It kind of made sense. But the deal was is that the supply and demand just went out of control. And people just, it, the, the entire retreat world just exploded because of all the puppies that everybody was trying to do just what I said. Uh, and then now all of a sudden, they got all these dogs are, you know, turned six months, eight, 10 months, 12 months old, and uh, they needed training. And so now, you know, all the trainers that are out here uh, are just absolutely packed full of dogs and, you know, have and a lot of good, well-bred dogs. Uh, out here that are, you know, we're trying to get trained now for people that are now going back to work, like Josh was saying, and now, you know, everybody's resumed life as normal. And uh, we still have these dogs here that they're going to be, you know, that they're going to have for the next 10, 12 years. And so we're just trying to get them trained up for them now so they can go home and enjoy them again. Uh, but it, I don't really think there was any better time on earth and in, in for the, in the, the normal family household for people to raise a puppy and do what we would all like to do, spend the amount of time that we could with it. Because, I mean, I know in my life, uh, I got to do a lot of things during that time that I would never get to do again, uh, you know. And so uh, it was some some great memories for me, and I'm sure a lot of people made some great memories with their puppies. Uh, but now we got to make sure that they are good citizens and, and good house pets from this point forward, for sure. Yeah, no, that's good. Yeah, COVID has affected everything in life. If you guys follow some of the, I guess, the, some of the outdoor uh, literature or, or, or communication, there was an uptick in hunting license purchases over the last year. Everyone in, you know, in, I guess, the hunting world, you know, from, you know, state government or, or hunter recruitment professionals, it, they do chalk it up. We all chalk it up to COVID giving us something that nothing else could give us. And that's time. And so it's, you know, it, it did catch me off guard to think that it, you know, it, it spilled over into the sporting dog world. But if I sit and think about it for a second, why wouldn't it? You, you said something there, Chris, and, and, and uh, also you, Josh, there's, I've always trained my own dogs my own horses i've i've never sent one off to a trainer and i've always wondered what is that personal relationship that so let's say i buy a puppy and i send it off to a kennel for for training for the summer or for whatever period of time and i get that back am i missing out on something am i missing out on a personal bond with that dog by being absent for that period of time you want to go first josh yeah i i I, yeah well so Here's what's funny about that is that everybody, Chris, is probably the same way. People will, will 
approached me with that question, they're sheepish about it, right? Because they're like, ah, oh, he probably doesn't want me to work with my own dog because this is this is what you know he does, or I don't want you know him to think I'm asking him secrets or anything like that. I love when people train their own dog because I, I think that when you go through the roller coaster that is that training you know, process, you have more of an appreciation of that end result, right? Like you, like for us, Chris and I. Every day we're, we're dealt with hurdles and how are we going to overcome that hurdle to get to the next step, right? When, when we go through that with a dog and get to that end result, like I think there's an appreciation for it for most people. I think they understand that this wasn't you know, a real easy task and that you know, we made it. And I think, you know, okay, now I can go do all this cool stuff and this great stuff. And for a lot of people, at least for a lot of our clients, it's the time, right? Like they just, they don't have the time, whether it's because of the kids, because of the work, because of you know, whatever life has going on. And this is what it takes is time, you know, to get through this. But I love when people go through the process themselves, because I do think that when you go out in that field and you run that first blind retrieve or, or you have the first group that dog was steady, there's, there's an additional appreciation for it because you saw what it took to get there. And so I, I personally, I love that side of it. I think that um, I think it challenges people to step up to the plate and spend that time and, and really get you know, put a goal down, dedicate yourself to it and work as a team to get there. Um, but I would also say that that's where it comes down to, if you have your dog professionally trained, that's where it's, it's my job and it's Chris's job to come in and spend the time with you to teach you how to drive the car. You know, I like to say that, you know, I can, I can hand you the keys to a Ferrari, but if you don't know how to drive a stick shift, that pretty car is not going to go anywhere. Right. It's the same thing with these dogs. It's, you know, you're, we're not, handing over a robot that you're going to be able to just walk through duck season now, even though you don't know what's going on. You have to be able to you know, drive the car. You have to have the knowledge of how to get that done. And that really, yeah, that's where it falls on us. You know, we've done the work, we've trained the dog. Now the important part there is training you. And so, um, yeah, yeah, I do think, you know, maybe you're missing something, but at the same time, um, I do know how valuable that time in the field is. And if you don't have the time to, to dedicate to the dog or the knowledge or the tools to dedicate to the dog, to get them there, you know, sometimes the best thing to do is, you know, you know, hand it off to someone like Chris or myself and, you know, we can do that so you can better enjoy your time, probably limited time, you know, in the field. It's probably like marriage counseling. Like you go through the, the, in, instead of going through all that, that uh, madness with a poorly trained dog, send it off to the trainer and you have a, 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 a I guess, a more peaceful, a more quality experience in the field, perhaps. Right. Very real good. You know, I think the thing is, is it becomes the word pride, I think, is what is what all of us. I don't know, Joel, if you've ever built anything with a piece of furniture, a uh, flower bed, whatever it is. They probably have to mow the yard. You know, if you mow your own yard, when you make that last pass and you're headed towards the garage and you look over there and you just got done mowing your yard, there's a certain amount of pride that you've got in that. Now, it may not be angle striped and it may not be perfectly weed eated. It may not be, but you have some pride in that that you did it yourself. Although it's not as good as it would have been done if that, and it may be done at the right time uh, when that professional uh, landscape crew came in and did it because they're going to do it on an on a exact manner. It's going to be every Monday afternoon. It's going to be, they'll be there between one and three. Uh, everything's going to be done. They got the best equipment. They got the best manpower. They can jump in, jump out. It's done. It's done right. Gone. You just pull up after work and just enjoy the benefit. Well, that's kind of the way the dog training thing is. Most people don't have the time and energy. I mean, let's face it. You, you said you've got some children. You got horses. I got children. I got horses. I know what kind of time all that takes. It's a, it's, it's a time disaster. So getting out there every day after work, after feeding the horses, after mowing the yard, after going to dance, baseball, football, soccer, you know, getting home. And the last thing you want, you're just lucky. Get home, get a little food down, you can go to bed, do it again tomorrow. And that's where Josh and I really come into play. You know, we're, of course, we're going to make the dog better than, than the average guy can. I mean, I made my own dog training videos called uh, Duck Dog Basic with Chris Aiken. It's a three series set. We sold literally tens of thousands of them and still do. And it's a great set for guys. It's a play by play, step by step process. Uh, it went over unbelievable. I couldn't believe how well it went over. And, and, uh, and we sold them, Avery, Avery sold them for us, and, and we used them tons of sport dog product in there. And, and it, it went really, really well. And we were promoting people to train their dog themselves. But it, Darn internet, he's frozen.
the event oh. that they couldn't, then they would bring them to us. And my favorite, can you hear me? Oh yeah, you're going right again. Now. Yeah, you were like a, right. you were like <laughs> my, my favorite, computer. my favorite dog. My, my, I think my favorite dog was is the guy that started the dog himself and got the dog going, and then he brought it to me and let me train it. People were like, well, why in the world would that be? Well, my deal was was that a lot of times when I first started doing this for literally for 20 years, 15 years, people would show up a dog at six months old, and I'd say, hey, what does what does Susie know? And they'd be like, man, nothing. We didn't want to mess her up, so we did nothing with her. And I'm like, well, wow, you just did mess her up by doing nothing with it well through the videos people would get involved in it and they'd get them in the water and they'd get them on birds and they'd get them retrieving cute and they'd do a little heel a little bit of sit a little bit of stay and then they'd realize because of life they just didn't have the time and energy to do it and so they'd bring the dog to us and now we had a real good candidate to take off and run with you know and we had a blast doing that and working for people that started with our videos and let us finish it up. Or they even trained it through maybe the started dog program themselves and didn't have the real estate or the manpower or whatever to do the advanced stuff with the hand signals and blind retrieves and let us do it for them. So it's all been really well, even working as a partnership with the owner and let them do part of it and us do part of it. Or on the backside, let us do all of it and then just show you where the bells and whistles are and the buttons to push and, and, to, and to send the dog home and let them enjoy the dog from there. And don't get me wrong, just because we send them home doesn't mean we're, we're done. I mean, we lots of, Josh can tell you, lots of phone calls and lots of text and, and uh, you know, what should I do here? What should I do there? We were definitely a, a, a maintenance support group for sure. So uh, you have to hire a home. call center. The call center. That's now. right. Right. That's exactly yeah. right. Hey, I, I, I warned you guys. We were, like gonna, we were gonna jump around, uh, and so I'm gonna live up to that uh, up to that forecast. Training products, right? So obviously, you guys talk a lot about the training side. So let's talk about a little bit of training products. You know, as as we've discussed, you know, before you know we started recording this podcast, you know, two big brands, you know, Sport Dog and Yukonuba, they're they're you know, they, they're good to Delta, you know, and we definitely identify with them. And we also understand that you guys have relationships with both sport dog and Yukonuba. Josh, I understand you're the product training specialist. That's the, the title I see on your email signature. <laughs> yeah. And Chris, I see you're the se a senior pro staff member. And so that's correct. Yeah. And so, so let's deal with more of the training product side. If you guys you know, what are some, you know, if you jump on the sport dog website, what are some of the products that you guys use in your everyday life that you would recommend our listeners look at or use as well? Josh, let's start with you. What are some of the products that you couldn't live without? You know, it's funny. So being that you know, I'm a British lab guy, not that I don't love my you know, American labs that we train, but that's what I breed are British labs. Spend a lot of time overseas, you know, bringing dogs in that, uh, that, you know, fit what I'm looking for as far as my breeding program goes. A lot of people make the assumption that because of that, that I'm, you know, that I'm either anti e collar or they're shocked that, that I, you know, I use an e collar with my training. But here's the deal is that one, a British lab is not any different than an American Labrador. There's different, you know, different, maybe different traits and different lines, different things like that, but they're both Labrador retrievers, right? So like when people are like, oh, you can use a collar in a British lab, well, there's still a lamb, right? Now with the product itself, Here's why you know, I, I believe in, in using this product. There is not another way to correct a dog at a distance without an e-collar. I mean, unless you've got something I've never heard of before, there's not another way to do it. And so when we talk about communication, we talk about clarity to the dog, communicating clearly to the dog. If that dog is at a distance, and let's just say the dog blows off a you know, whistle. Without a collar to let the dog know, hey, you did that wrong, make the right correction. The only other option you have is you better have a really good pair of tennis shoes on because you're running after that dog. And by the time you get to that dog, one, the dog probably has no idea why you're there because he's moved on to something else. And then two, you're probably a little more upset than you were about 30 seconds ago and might do something that, that you regret. And so it's, it's a tool that just you can use properly, just like any tool, right? That's the only argument that I've ever heard on it. It, it adds so much clarity to the communication process. And especially as we start stretching out at a distance, it's a, it's a really, really valuable tool. The other thing that it does for me is that it keeps dogs safe. And I think that's the biggest part of this. I mean, these, these dogs are all family members to us. 
It keeps dogs safe. If you have a dog that is, you know, getting out of control, going towards a road, maybe on a retrieve, he can't hear you. You can communicate and stop. And if you're an upland hunter, the hen gets up, you can't shoot. The dog wants to chase after that or chase after a deer, right? You can, you can stop the dog under control and keep them safe. And so, um, you know, it's, it's a great tool for us that we use, you know, every day, you know, throughout our process here. Um, so I, I'll let Chris jump in here before I go any, any further, but that's kind of a, a big point for me. Okay, so we crossed the e-collar off the list. Chris, what you got? Yeah, so, you know, I think when everything starts, we've got to have, you know, just a standard leash and collar uh, for the dog to do all your basic training with. Uh, you know, we use a long line a lot, you know, like a 30-foot rope, and we're doing all the basic stuff. You know, to me, the e-collar, which is, I mean, everything Josh said was spot on. Uh, that is the number one training tool and I'm going to call it a training tool. I'm going to call it a polishing tool. It's the number one polishing tool ever created for a, for a dog. And the deal is, like Josh said, the timing's impeccable. The distances are, are unlimited. I mean, it's just unbelievable what all you can do with it. But if you take from, from start to finish on a dog, if you've got a flat, a flat buckle collar, a nice leash, an e-collar, uh, a 30-foot long line, and some rubber bumpers, preferably white, uh, or white and black, well, then you've got about everything a man needs to get going. And uh, this this is not a, a very expensive sport when it comes to the equipment. Uh, I, and I will tell you this, when I first started training dogs in 1989, you look this up, a brand new uh, e-collar was $989. You could buy a decent pickup truck for that at that time, <laughs> a good used truck. And and, and it, wasn't, it didn't even last very long. The thing was junk. And uh, it is it just wasn't any good. That was a lot of money to me back then, for sure. And now, you know, you can buy the best collar uh, there is in the country for under four hundred dollars, tax and all. And uh, and so, you know, the technology's come so far. That collar before had one button on it, and and you just you hit the, you had to change out some plugs. You couldn't do it on the fly. Now these collars you can adjust on the fly. You can adjust to customize the dog low, medium, or high. I mean, it's just absolutely unbelievable what these collars can do today. Not even use a you can use a vibrate, use a tone, or use stimulation. I mean, the technology is just out there. It's unbelievable. But I think of an e collar. Uh, everybody calls it a training collar. I think it was a polishing collar. So I, I got to go back to the leash and collar and, and, and long line and teach that dog everything with those first and then polish that thing up with a collar and make that dog great. Because it is it is definitely the shellac on top of the wood. It is definitely what's going to make that wood, that grain pop. It's what's going to make it good. It's going to make your life easier. And like Josh said, it can save that dog's life day in, day out. Uh, that dog's headed to the road. He's chasing the neighbor's cat. You got it on a one or a two. He doesn't stop. No big deal. Three, four. If that doesn't stop, let's just flip on over here to seven or eight. It'll stop him in his tracks and get him back in there. So, you know, it's just technology today. I'd, I'd love to know. This is one question I'd have for God if I could talk to him today. God, how many dogs has an e-collar saved their life to date? That would be a great number for me to know because it would be that tens of thousands, tens of thousands. And, uh, and, and I'm just telling you, it's, it's the greatest tool ever invented for sure. Yeah. I, I think that I agree with both of you guys. I have my own personal feelings that I've developed, you know, with e-collars over time. I started thinking, oh, they're cruel, right? Cause it's just, was what I heard back when they were, I'd call them new, even though they've been around for a while, Chris, but it's for me, like my, my lab quite sensitive to, to stimulation. And so once I introduced him to, you know, to the electrical stimulation, to this day, all he needs is the tone. He reacts to the tone like I had it set to 10,000 volts or something like that. It's just amazing. It's just, a, it's just a communication tool. He feels nothing. There's nothing negative. It's just we're talking. We're talking at a distance. I'm not yelling or losing my voice. It's clear communication. He knows exactly what I want. And, you know, it's just that timing, you know, it's it's awesome. I do like that it, one. It's, it's your mama throwing your middle name in your name. You know what your I'm saying? Attention. That's right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't heard that. I like that one. That's exactly what it's doing. You knew when mama threw your middle name in there, it was time to get to the house. And that's exactly exactly what that tone's doing. It's throwing your middle name in your name. I can tell you right now. It, yeah. things, things can get serious if need to be. So, And hey, that's what it's all about, figuring out the minimum amount of stimulation that you have to give the dog to get the most result. And that's what you've done with your dog. And so it's brilliant. 
That's right. That's right. No, this is great. Hey, we could talk forever. We're going to jump over to another side of it. This is a side nutrition, right? And so again, you both have relationships with Yukonuba as does Delta, but let's use this as a placeholder. You guys probably are working your dogs hard year round. So maybe the diet plan that you have your dogs on is maybe different than, you know, a, a, just a, an everyday guy who doesn't work with dogs for a living, but just hunts. So year round, you know, let's, let's kind of speak towards the, if there is such a thing as a typical dog owner, what, what would you guys recommend as far as nutrition, changing diet, modifying diet? What would you look at? Can I go first, yes, Josh? Yeah. Can I go first on this? Cause I'm, I'm pretty strong opinion about this. So I think of dog food is fuel. Okay. I fuel for the dog. Okay. And so my question to anybody that, that does this deal where they're swapping foods from time to time, at what point in time do you put sorrier gas, less gas, worse gas, not as good a gas in your car or in your truck? Zero. You always want to put the very best gas in your vehicle, the best diesel in your truck that you can for year round because it does. we're not just talking about performance. We're talking about there's a lot of health things that go into this. But we always want to want to feel our bodies, want to feel the dog's body uh, every day, because that dog doesn't know that he's off work. I mean, you know, this dog is doing everything he can. Uh, he's burning energy just adoring you. Okay, so no matter what you got to do, you feed that dog. You can do a thirty twenty performance immediately. And let me tell you something. You know, yes. Yes, yes, I am sponsored by you can do. I'm not denying that, but let me tell you something. In 30 years, I've fed them all. I've fed every single one of them. I've gone from tit to tat, and I've tried them all, bought them all, been giving them all. I'm going to tell you right now, this is without a doubt the very best dog food. I don't have any trouble with weights. If anything, I'm getting in trouble for dogs being on the heavy side. Josh and I talked about that the other day. I get hair coats are incredible. Teeth are good and clean. They got good, clean eyes on them. I'm not having near the veterinarian expenses that I used to have before. Uh, I had dog foods that I fed that I can guarantee you when a new dog checked in here, you can put 30 days on the calendar. Dog has to go to vet for blood and stool in 30 days. And it, it is, and we kept trying to help the company and kept trying, just never did come up with it. We don't have any of that with you. And understand I'm feeding over a hundred dogs a day here and 99% of them have zero problems on it. That's like saying a hundred people can eat Chinese food, man. There's just not a hundred people you and I hang out with that can eat Chinese food, not have some stomach problems. We have 99 here that don't have stomach problems. So if I can keep their weight, their teeth, their stool, their hair coat looking good and mainly their weight. Cause let me just tell you something. I train for other people. I get paid by other people to train their dog. When uh, husband and wife and kids get here, if their dog comes out skinny, hair dull, not looking like he's all happy and perky and looking like he's healthy, I'm in trouble no matter if he can go out here and make a 400-yard retrieve. They don't care. All they're worried about is what's going on with my dog. I just He just made a 400-yard retrieve through three different ponds. It doesn't matter. He's skinny. He doesn't look good. So I'm just telling you, 30-20 makes my life easier. I know it does Josh's, and it will anybody else's too. It is the only dog food out there. And there's been some other brands out there that got a lot of national recognition. They've, they've had some dogs in the past and done real well. That dog food's not the same today as it was two and three years ago. Everybody's out there chasing the dollar, chasing the profits, doing whatever, and it's costing their food. Not you can do with 30 20. I'm telling you, it's the best dog. I hate to sound like a, a used car salesman. I'm just telling you, I'm very passionate about it. And if there's anything you take away from this podcast, get you some you can do with 30 20 because it is the real deal. No, I appreciate that. I also appreciate, you know, this, this, you know, you sharing that you have a long history with other products, which I think strengthens or deepens, you know, the advice that you're giving. I guess, you know, if you stay, you know, in a quality line of dog food, but do you see people shifting weight control? You know, like, again, I'm thinking of the, the, the individual that hunts their dog hard for a couple months and then it maybe live in, lives in a hot climate or in a cold climate, and they end up more of a couch dog and putting on that weight. Yeah, I think the the proper advice would be exercise your dog, work your dog. That's your responsibility. But does diet, shifting dog foods within a line of quality dog food, does that take place much? I, I don't, but I'm, I'm wondering if that's a if that's a tip for anyone else. Well, my, my deal is we may feed less if they're doing less 
we may feed more if they're doing more, but swapping dog foods, we don't know. Josh, you may have a totally uh, different opinion on all that, but I, uh, I would say that the main thing is we just adjust the amount of food that we intake on, on the dog. You know, if, if we may go from here, they may be eating four cups and home, they may be eating two and a half or three. Okay. And uh, because they're doing a whole lot less. Uh, but, but as far as, you know, swapping diets and stuff, we don't do that uh, at all. So Josh, what do you, what, what's your theory on that? I didn't mean to hog that whole conversation. I'm just very passionate about that. No, I, I enjoyed listening to it because I couldn't agree more with everything that you had to say. And what's so interesting to me is that you're just like, you know, Chris, I mean, I fed a, a number of different foods and I didn't understand. I didn't know what I didn't know. Right. And so like, yeah, you're on a food, you, you think something's normal. You know, like for me, I have, I have a dog, one of my um, personal dogs that you know, a lot of people, you know, notice cause he's been on a, on a lot of uh, you know, ads and stuff is Brock. So Brock is, he's a very special dog. He goes everywhere with me. But when I got to hunting season in particular, he was getting fed between six and eight cups a day because he would lose a bunch of weight. It was hard to keep it on him. Um, and I'd say on average, he was he was getting fed you know, between, you know, probably you know, six ish you know, cups a day is what he was getting fed every day. Brock today mm -hmm. on You Can Do With 3020 is getting fed three cups a day. He looks better. He has better energy. He has better recovery. His coat is fantastic. His teeth are great. I mean, there is not a negative thing that I can say about it. And I could say that dog for dog, I could go down the line with all my dogs. And I can go down specifically in the kennel because that's the big part of this that, you know, from a professional side, I'm glad that Chris you know, pointed this out because I think sometimes this part of it is taken for granted because when someone brings a dog into us for training, yeah, they're there for training. But the training is a pretty small piece of the whole thing. When you start talking about the care of the dogs, the cleanliness of the kennel, everything else that has to be done. And just to Chris's point, I mean, we were double and triple feeding dogs just to try to keep weight on them with different foods. And we couldn't keep up. We couldn't keep. Yeah, and just again, like Chris had said, people would come and, you, and we would communicate this. It was overly communicated that I do not like the weight to that the dog is at. We're trying this. We're up to, you know, six, seven, eight cups a day trying to keep weight on him. Okay. That sounds great. That sounds great. But when they came and they saw the dog was underweight, it was still on me, right? Like I'm doing everything I possibly can, but the food just wasn't doing it for them. We are not seeing that today. And that is something that has made my life a heck of a lot easier, um, way less stressful. It is a huge, huge deal that, that we have to deal with. And when you're dealing with the number of dogs that, you know, Chris and I are dealing with, you start to see these things on a much larger scale. So what I would challenge people on is if you are seeing, you know, these things, whether it's you have to increase your, your food dramatically, if you're not being able to put weight on, energy is not there, recovery is not there. Yeah, I would, I would highly suggest that you try this because I cannot believe the night and day difference that I'm seeing with my dogs on the You Can Do With 3020. And I mean, I, I, I cannot say enough good things about it. And I can say time and time again, we have clients come back and a guy today come and bring his dog back in and say, I cannot believe the difference that this food is making. It is, it is undeniable when you see it. I mean, it is, you know, we talk about athletes, right. And how the athletes, you know, they eat better than we do, right. Whether it's the you other know, private chefs or, you know, the, the food that they're taking in or the, how much they're taking in the quality they're taking in, they're not going to McDonald's, right. They're not going to run through fast food every day. That's the same thing with our dogs. We, we need to treat them as the athletes that they are. And that starts with feeding them the right fuel. Th that's really good advice. And so I guess modifying the amount of food that you feed based on, I guess, the physical demands or the output of that dog at the given time of the year. That's what I do too. So, but it comes with a lot more strength coming from you guys who do this for a living. So I appreciate it. Well, you know, as I, as, I, as I find this, as I watch this podcast myself and Ray, I see how passionate Josh and I both get about that because you know, we're talking about the dog's health and we're talking about the main ingredient that that dog, the one thing we can give that dog, uh, we may not can give him the best duck club in the state. We may not can give him the best pheasant field in the, in the country. We may not can give him the best shooter in the field, but we can give him the best dog food. And it's the easiest thing for us to do. And, you know, Josh, you brought up a point. You were double and triple feeding. When, when I, the, the, the day that I left my last dog food, my guy that feeds dogs came in here and he said, he said, Chris, I want to make you wear something. He said, we are double feeding 22 dogs at this kennel today, 22. So that means they're giving them four to six cups in the morning and four to six cups in the afternoon. 
And he's like, well, okay, we're double feeding $22. Understand that on business side or a personal wallet size, when you're doing that, that was costing me 22 bags a month. A dog food minimum, it was costing me. So we're talking $1,000, $1,400 a month. It was costing me on, on, the, on the business side of things. We are not, we have not, we are not, and probably not going to have to double feed any dogs here. Hadn't in, since we swapped you to Nuba 3020. And not only that, if I get in trouble for anything now, I had three different clients when I'm here today commented on their dogs on the heavy side. And I said, hey, you know what? Say all you want. I'm good with it. I'm, I'm, I'm perfectly fine. If you think your dog's three or four pounds away, that sounds a whole lot better to me than mom sitting over there going, I don't know about this guy. I don't know what's going on with my dog. My baby looks a little thin. His hair looks a little dingy. And I just don't know what's going on right here. You know what I mean? That's just, and that's what they do. It doesn't matter how well we've trained them, how much time we've spent with them in the field, how many drills we've taught them. It doesn't matter when we're on the fin side, you know? And, and this all starts from day one with these puppies. I mean, we're feeding these guys. Uh, the Yukonuba puppy, and we swap over about six months old, get a little 30 20, and uh, it has worked really, really well for us. I mean, that is, that is, you can tell Josh and I are very passionate about that, and uh, it just makes our life so much easier. I mean, it just, it just does, it makes us look good. That's, that's, what yeah, I like. that, that is awesome, guys. Yeah, you know, we, I think we could talk. Well, we could, I know we could, we could talk for days about dogs. We've run about an hour here, and so. I think we're going to kind of start to wrap this one up here and I would like to have you guys back on to maybe we'll pick a particular aspect of training of hunting as it relates to dogs and, and let's beat the heck out of it. Does that sound agreeable to you guys at some point in the future? Now I lost you. Oh, everybody froze except me. Well, folks, I'm assuming that you can still hear me. We did lose both uh, Josh and Chris, but uh, we're going to wrap this one up. We appreciate these guys. If you want to get in touch with either well, one of these individuals, oh, you're listening up now. I'm wrapping it up for you. For yeah. some reason, everybody was was leaving me, but uh, but I appreciate it. I do want to get you both back on the podcast here at some time. We'll talk about it. In the meantime, just want to let everybody know that Delta does have a dedicated email address for this podcast. If you have any questions for these guys, it's podcast at deltawaterfowl.org. If you want to reach out to either Chris or Josh on their own, you can look up web-footed kennels for, for, uh, for Chris and for Josh. If I have it right, it's uh, Riverstone Kennels? Correct. That's correct. Yeah, look it up. Both, both uh, some quality guys, as you can tell here, and who are really passionate about what they do, really passionate about their dogs, um, breeding of quality dogs. And so I really appreciate the time. Hopefully people have learned something here, but again, we're going to bring you on in the future and we'll discuss it further. So thank you guys very much. Any parting comments? Good oh, luck and have fun. You got to have fun. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a lot of fun to watch them grow. A lot of fun to watch them get better every day and just enjoy the ride. Awesome. That's good words. Yeah. Take, take your time and enjoy this because you know, these next couple of months, this is crunch time, you know, so, so take your time be intentional with your training and, uh, and enjoy it because season will be here before you know it. Awesome. Awesome guys. I really enjoyed it. And honestly, I learned something too. So hopefully everyone else did, but, uh, until our paths cross in the future, you guys take care. Thank you, buddy. All right. Thanks guys. Thank you.